Hello there. I'm the serial plagiarist, and I think that it's probably best that I read novels in order of release past Hair to the Empire. I'm going to get completely lost on post-Return of the Jedi stories if I don't read the expanded universe written as it was coming out. That means that I'm going to start reading novels like Truce at Bakura in the near future. I also have a solution to my non-reading mentality. I downloaded an extension to Google Docs in the form of a natural AI reader. So basically, I'm going to listen to an AI roughly read the story. It's not a perfect solution, and I wish Disney would just remaster the old books in audiobook form, but that's their way of ensuring people aren't too educated on the expanded universe if they aren't heavy readers. I'm also going to play Jedi Academy as Luke Skywalker, given there's not enough visual representation of the story, and showcasing pictures on screen in case there is a visual representation for something. So, doing my research, I realised next in line after the Thrawn trilogy is the Jedi Prince series. Yeah, that's what it's called. First I thought, where in the world would there be a Jedi Prince? Unless it's someone like Count Dooku, who was a Count of Sereno, but gave up that lifestyle to become a Jedi. Then he came back to it when he fell to the dark side and left the Jedi Order. Point is, Jedi Prince is a weird name for a series. To expanded universe fans, Jedi Prince has commonly been ignored, with even future writers themselves ignoring it too. And the reason why is simple. It's perhaps one of the weirdest Star Wars stories you'll ever read. Before Disney. Ah! Yeah, Disney tends to publish a lot of shit that doesn't fit with the Star Wars universe at all. You're bound to hear about a comic where this or that happened, and it's a real head-scratcher. Still though, the Expanded Universe was not entirely innocent from this either. While many stories may be viewed as weird because they predated the prequel trilogy in release, as the implied backstory was different from what the prequel showed, and most writers had to come up with their own head canon for the years predating A New Hope. Even with that standard in mind, Jedi Prince is weird and bizarre like you wouldn't believe. The first book alone had some crazy shit in it. While something like Yislamari are an understandable addition without the context of the prequel trilogy, not everything was like that. The stuff in Jedi Prince genuinely feel like they were written by a madman. And that's no disrespect to the authors given this was super early EU content past Hand to the Empire, but still, it feels as if someone was on a high quantity of drugs. Still though, there's two compliments I'll give it. It's entertaining, and absurdly original. I think the stuff in the books are more suited for stuff like Star Trek. But hey, we're in an age where we don't really get anything creative out of Star Wars anymore. So without further ado, let's get into Jedi Prince. We're going to review every book in order, and I will share my thoughts on them. Each book is relatively short, so yeah. You saw the title correctly. This is about the glove of Darth Vader, not Vader's fist as in the 501st Legion, but rather his literal glove. You might be wondering what the hell would be so significant about his glove, and well, I wouldn't know either. As the first book in the Jedi Prince series, this book is bizarre and absurd. Shortly after Return of the Jedi, we get these weird ass dark side prophets who proclaim that the next Emperor will wear, surprise surprise, the glove of Darth Vader. Apparently the glove that Luke chopped off in the climax of that movie is indestructible and is floating out there somewhere. So yeah, we're already off to an interesting start. After that point, we are dropped into the main story which is basically a quick setup with R2 and 3PO sent on a mission to the planet Kessel, described as a world full of spice mines and prisons. So yeah, R2 and 3PO get a paint job and are sent to spy on the Imperials there, and come across this dude named Grand Moff Hissa, who is this half-human, half Sephi half dude. You might be wondering why the hell they let a half-alien as a Grand Moff when someone like Thrawn is clearly a strict exception, but you haven't heard the worst of it. Hissa is subservient to an even weirder looking dude named Trioculus, who is the slave lord of Kessel. The two give a grand speech to other Imperials on the world, in which Trioculus Trioculus claims himself as their heir to the Empire. 
because apparently he's Palpy's biological son. Trioculus is described as an almost handsome human-like man if it weren't for the third eye on his forehead. Gee, that lightning mace Windu deflected back at Palpatine must have affected his nutsack too. Because there's no other way this guy could be Palpatine's son unless it was like a dark side experiment that Palpatine created and decided to keep around for whatever reason. Seriously, I'm not making any of this up. The image I showed you of Trioculus is not fan art. It's on Wikipedia as the official portrait for the character. I don't know whether or not to be lenient because this is a junior novel, but they don't really explain where the hell this guy came from and why he suddenly has a substantial claim to the Imperial Throne just because he claims he's Palpy's son. Later on, it unsurprisingly turns out that he's not Palpy's son. Shocker. But then they mention another dude who is legitimately the Emperor's son, and it's a guy by the name of Triclops, who like Trioculus, is this weird ass mutant guy, also with a third eye, but this time on the back of his head. Anyways, with that being said, Trioculus has an artificial lightning attachment, so he can replicate the Emperor's powers of force lightning. And he uses it on a Grand Admiral and a Royal Guard who questions his rule. First impressions, Trioculus is a total lunatic, as he of course commits my most hated trope, the villain kills his own men cliche. It is worth noting, however, that Trioculus is propped up as a figurehead, while the Committee of Grand Moths intend to hold the true power. Due to the weird prophecy I mentioned earlier about the true Emperor possessing the glove of Darth Vader, Trioculus is determined to find it before anyone else with a claim to the Imperial Throne. One of Trioculus' competitors is Grand Admiral Joseph Grunger. And here, I didn't realise that there were a bunch of Grand Admirals and Grand Moths. With the former, I've heard that there can only be around 12 at a time, and that included Thrawn. And with the Grand Moths, I used to think there was only one, and when Tarkin died, he left an unfillable void. But nope, there were a bunch of Grand Moths. I've heard that there's at least two dozen of them in the Expanded Universe, so not a very significant title. Anyways, they have to get the glove of Darth Vader. They find it out in space around Endor, but the Rebels intercept that information given R2 and 3PO, and so they pursue Trioculus across the Mon Calamari homeworld. That's where Luke Skywalker chases Trioculus, taking out one of his henchmen, named Captain Dunwell. But ultimately Trioculus gets away with the glove. The book at the end reveals that Trioculus isn't the true son of the Emperor. As I said, it's a dude named Triclops. Now I have to criticize how the names they came up with aren't very Star Warsian in nature. And that's book one. After reading all that, I have one thing to say to both of the authors. Do you smoke? Cigarettes? No. It's pretty wacky, but as I said, at least it's both entertaining and absurdly original. This never would have passed as a movie in the slightest. That's probably why the Expanded Universe was so good and original. It was maximum creativity for maximum entertainment. While this story is completely out of character for Star Wars, it's enjoyable enough to keep reading. And I actually kept thinking to myself what was going to happen next. So let's read the next book and find out. Impressions before reading based on the title tells me that we're in for another meth-fueled adventure. I didn't realize the Jedi would have a lost city. Maybe it has something to do with Tython, the Jedi homeworld. But given the loose continuity of this series in the larger expanded universe, I don't know. So anyways, this particular book picks up some time after the first book in which Luke receives a vision from Obi-Wan Kenobi telling him about the Lost City of the Jedi, which of course is the instigator for Luke's obsession to find the Lost City. Anyways, this is where we're introduced to a new character, a 12-year-old boy named Ken who lives in the titular City of the Jedi. His upbringing is extremely mysterious, as the book describes that he has spent his entire life surrounded by droids. There's a droid that poses as his best friend, and there's a droid that is basically his tutor and grades his work and so on. As far back as he can remember, the droids have refused to tell him where he came from, who his parents are, and so on. In other words... Withholding of information, you know, um, doing that intentionally is much more uh, engaging. Obviously, it's nowhere near as limiting as J.J. Abrams' mystery boxes. It's an interesting hook for this story, although I'd like to mention that this story's locations are surprisingly small. 
Upon first reading this book, I assumed the Lost City of the Jedi would be somewhere similar to Tython. But nope, it's actually way underneath the surface of Yavin 4. Yeah, that's right, Yavin 4. I think they just wanted to localize the story, so in a way, it's kind of lazy. To describe Ken as a character, I think he's supposed to embody really any kid's fantasy of a greater destiny and all that jazz. That's what got everyone to fall in Star Wars to begin with. It's a common theme, so I'm not going to knock back too much. This is a junior novel series after all. The story does a good job setting up his life in play, and how he feels constant curiosity with the outside world, and the droids refusing to tell him who he really is. Well, by the time the story starts, he gets too curious for his own good, and manages to briefly escape to the surface. This is where he comes into contact with Luke Skywalker. Ken in fact starts fanboying the fuck out as soon as he realizes he's talking to Luke Skywalker. As it turns out, The Lost City of the Jedi has a lot of tabs on recent events, and this is why Ken recognizes Luke. However, Ken's teacher droid forces him to go back underground, and it happens so fast that Luke doesn't even have time to follow, and now his search for the Lost City of the Jedi intensifies. Henry Jones and the Holy Grail? Now that was a little hobby compared to this. We also get caught up to speed on what the bad guys are doing. Trioculus and Grand Moff Hissa go up to meet with the Dark Prophet known as Cadden to get his Dark Blessing. I wondered why the hell Trioculus would care about any of this, and why he couldn't just take the claim to be Emperor. I mean the Thrawn trilogy was way more straightforward. Thrawn didn't need a fancy ritual to see his control. That's just why this stuff is so fascinating to read. It's so unlike Star Wars and you know it. Anyone else writing a Star Wars story would just have Trioculus claim the throne as Emperor like any other Imperial Warlord. Trioculus, after claiming the indestructible glove of Darth Vader, is then instructed to seek out the Jedi Prince. He's told that although he has the claim to Emperor, the only person who can stop him is the one called the Jedi Prince, and he can be found at the Lost City of the Jedi, located on Yavin 4. Anyways, with the information that he has to find the Jedi Prince, he proceeds to launch an attack on Yavin 4, and his forces cause a wildfire to get out of hand and burn the rainforest world. This is pretty wild, and things just get even weirder. Apparently Trioculus has devices installed on the glove to simulate the force, but this backfired on his health, and he is apparently struck blind as he is attacking the city, and he forces some local alien to get him a plant that will cure him, and he manages to restore his sight, but not before badly burning himself. As for Luke and Han, they make it underground to the lost city of the Jedi by Ken and his droids, in which apparently Yavin 4's weather is completely artificial, like it's a goddamn halo ring or something. They bypass the weather system and get it to rain, stopping the wildfire. This is also where Ken is finally allowed to leave the lost city, and he becomes quote, the newest youngest member of the Rebel Alliance, and that's a summary of book 2. And things just got even more random and weird. Knowing the expanded universe, when the hell did the Jedi build an underground city on Yavin 4? I remember how Tales of the Jedi later made Yavin 4 more Sith oriented in origin and the expanded universe just backed that up from there. Yeah, so already... These books are pretty standalone. Despite my complaints, this book series is still very much entertaining. We're introduced to Ken, who I think is introduced a book too late, but late is better than never. And it's not like I want to stop reading, it's this weirdness where you can tell that things are just going to get even more absurd that encourages you to keep going and not stop. So with that being said, let's get on to book 3. So yeah, you know that the first two books were created by some seriously drugged up meth fueled addicts selling their mothers out for their next hit. But wouldn't you know it, the third book is ironically more grounded in the Star Wars universe than the last two books. It's still a sequel to all the weird shit we got last time, but what new stuff they've got, it's stuff that is actually believable and not that absurd. So let's talk about it. The book starts off a lot more lax than last time. Han Solo's got a new house on Cloud City, and Luke, accompanied by R2, 3PO and Ken, and Ken's droid companion Microchip, 
I didn't really talk about him, but he's basically Ken's droid friend from the Lost City of the Jedi. He hasn't done much, which is why I neglected to mention him until now. They are traveling to Tatooine to go buy him a housewarming present. Everyone debates on numerous ideas, which is a completely relatable situation. Given I usually don't know what to get my brothers for Christmas or their birthday, given they're both in December. Anyways, they reason that Han, being as messy as he is with the Millennium Falcon, will need a house cleaning droid to assist him with everything. So Luke heads over to Tatooine to buy a droid from the Jawas. Something I was worried about when they had Ken join the Rebel Alliance is have him go full day Filoni and have Ken be an active battle participant like Ahsoka was. But thankfully, at least in this book, Ken is a support worker for the Rebels at best, and doesn't see any combat or trouble unless it's out of his protector's control, that being Luke. The start of this book is pretty normal. I can buy that Han got a place on Cloud City, and that's where his buddy Lando governs things. So Luke and friends land in Mos Eisley, and in case you didn't realize, Jabba the Hutt is pretty much the overarching posthumous antagonist of this book. Because we get introduced to his dad, Zorba the Hutt, who was ironically one of the few things from this book series that the future expanded universe didn't opt to ignore. As Luke and friends buy a droid nicknamed Kate, Zorba the Hutt comes into the story. Unaware that his son was dead, he's in for a rude surprise when it turns out that Jabba's place is completely vacant and claimed by the Tatooine government. It's referenced at the start of the book that Jabba had no will, and no obvious successor after his death. So as that's the case, he's told that Jabba no longer lives there as he moves to the front gate of Jabba's old place by that eyeball security droid. Zorba the Hutt is referenced as being quite close with his son, and he gets incredibly pissed off when he isn't let in. Now Zorba the Hutt canonically looks really weird, having a beard of all things, but aside from that, he does totally act like the average Hutt. He's pissed off easily and carries an aura of authority with him, so his introduction wasn't at all wasted. So upon being denied entrance, he goes over to Mos Eisley Cantina to ask the locals what happened to Jabba. This is also here where Grand Moff Hissa has a wanted poster, searching for a Jedi prince named Ken from the Lost City of the Jedi. There is no picture featured because they never got his face, but still. Zorba comes in and demands to know where Jabba is. And that's where Hissa in particular gives him the bad news. Jabba the Hutt is dead. Yeah, so Zorba is incredibly distraught over his son's death. He then presses on for more details, and he learns that Princess Leia of Alderaan killed him by means of strangulation. So naturally, Zorba the Hutt wants revenge. But first, he hires 10 bounty hunters from the cantina to help him enter Jabba's palace. There is a little bit where Zorba only agrees to pay them after, not before, and that's where they carve a hole through Jabba's palace door. And Zorba is able to squeeze himself inside, and then opts to go straight for one of Jabba's droids. A notable Chekhov's gun that they do that is pretty clever and subtle, is explaining why Jabba's palace was so dark. It was because the palace was built with ultraviolet luminous stones, and the book explains that humans and most aliens can't see ultraviolet light, but the Huts absolutely can. That does make a lot of sense. I kept wondering subconsciously why the lights in Jabba's palace were so goddamn dim. So I ironically accept this as a canonical answer. It's not like everything in this book series is ludicrous. And as I said, this is the most realistic to the Star Wars universe so far. So anyways, we cut to Luke Skywalker and friends hiding inside a Jawa sandcrawler after an attack by sand people. I hate them. After making it back to Moss Eisley, the group are ambushed by two bounty hunters and they have to flee with the X-Wing they landed with. Luke tries to question Ken on why Trioculus and the Empire want him so badly, and Ken lies that he doesn't know, although Chip spills the beans that Ken does know. However, Ken responds that he has to keep it a secret. Since in the last book, his droid tutor DJ told him so. I believe the secret was that Trioculus of course wasn't the true son of the Emperor. It was Triclops. Anyways, they go over to Cloud City and meet Governor Lando Calrissian. As it turns out, there's an Imperial presence nearby with a factory run by Trioculus churning out weapons. And they're heavily polluting the air as they're doing it. 
I have to question why they haven't given Lando shit for anything, given his role in the Rebel Alliance, but anyways. They all go to Han Solo's new place, and it's here where we get a bunch of banter between characters. Han is presented with his new house cleaning droid, and he takes the opportunity to make flirty remarks to Leia, and this is where Ken using a pair of macro binoculars gifted to Han during this party, notices a hot spaceship docking into the city. It's explained here that Jabba had an off-screen casino on Cloud City, and you can easily piece together that Zorba the Hutt has come right after getting his business settled on Tatooine. So that's where Zorba makes his rude entrance, demanding to see Lando Calrissian as he's denied entrance to Jabba's old suite once again. And by the time Lando shows up, Zorba tells him to pack his things and get out, and after a bit of arguing, Lando challenges Zorba to a game of Sabacc. If he wins, Zorba's gotta leave, and if Zorba wins, he gets the governorship of Cloud City, and Lando's gotta leave and never come back. Lando is completely confident he will win, even going as far to explain that his loss to Han in the Millennium Falcon was the kick in the nuts he needed to prevent another mistake. With that being said, they shake on it, but Zorba demands they play with his deck. Lando naturally refuses, since there were plenty of decks all over the casino. Zorba counters that it's his casino, and Lando counters further that he's got no legal claim to it, since Jabba never left a will. And that's where Zorba reveals his trap card. He plays the recording he got earlier in the story, in which Jabba lists off that all of his shit goes to his father, in the event that his dad's still alive when he passes. That's where we get some interesting information, in which Jabba says that he has no wife or children. That would be another small detail Dave Filoni overlooked. But since Jedi Prince is widely disregarded by the rest of the expanded universe, this is a time Filoni gets a free pass for his lack of attention to detail. I still don't like the addition of Jabba having a son, it makes him look less greedy and evil, and he's never mentioned in post-Return of the Jedi stories, as he's obviously Jabba's natural successor. Zorba is more plausible than Rodda. Anyways, Lando's overconfidence gets the best of him, as Zorba's deck had marks that only a creature that can see ultraviolet light can see, which is a good Chekhov's gun as I alluded earlier. Earlier, it was a natural explanation of why Jabba's palace was so damn dark, but now, we see that Lando loses Cloud City on a whim, and he's forced to pack all his shit and leave. He soon after contacts Han, and informs him of his lethal mistake. Zorba the Hutt is now governor of Cloud City, and on top of that, turns out Han's housewarming droid Kate fell out of the balcony and into the clouds. How the hell that happened, I have no idea. Although I guess it was sort of a sneaky way to move the plot along. The reason I say that is when Luke and Leia get onto a land speeder to speed down and catch Kate, we have the book's excuse to have them go to the Imperial factory. However, they are very quickly shot down. After some struggling, Luke realizes that after being split up, the stormtroopers had taken Leia away. Meanwhile, we get Han and Chewie leaving Ken after getting a distress message from Leia, and so Ken is left all alone in Han's place. They have this Anakin pod racing moment, where after a long while of waiting, Ken gets in one of the cloud cars, pretending to fly it, only to accidentally have the cloud car launch right off. But he's able to control it due to quote, reading about controlling ships from his time on Yavin 4. Despite that, he's apprehended by the Cloud City Police, who recognize him as Ken, the one wanted by the Empire, and so they decide to bring him to Zorba the Hutt. Now here comes a really cheesy moment. This was mentioned at the end of the last book, but Trioculus has a delusional lust for Princess Leia. Unsurprisingly, Leia wants nothing to do with him, but he keeps insisting that she marry him and become Queen of the Empire. There's even a part in the book where it says that Trioculus is just hoping that if Leia stays with him long enough, she'll be his. It kind of reminded me of the Super Mario movie, the animated one. We all know that song Peaches? Yeah, well this is a less but still awkward version of that. It was sort of childish that Trioculus had a thing for Princess Leia, so much to the point that he was willing to make it his biggest weakness, 
and I mean it. Zorba soon learns of Leia's capture and is willing to trade Ken in order to get his revenge on Leia. So Zorba and Trioculus meet up to discuss the transaction and I could see what was going to happen ahead of time. Trioculus upon meeting Ken is surprised because he was expecting at least a man. And Ken remarks back that he knows that he's a complete fraud and not the Emperor's real son. When Trioculus asks what Zorba wants in exchange for Ken, Zorba demands Trioculus shut down his factory causing all the pollution. And the second is Princess Leia. But of course, this demand is too high for Trioculus, and he refused to give her up. And so a fight between the two ensues, resulting in Zorba claiming victory and freezing Trioculus in Carbonite. Meanwhile, Ken manages to free himself with a Jedi mind trick on the Cell Guard, and to be honest, it really reminded me of the implausibility of Rey doing that in The Force Awakens. Ken is even younger and more inexperienced. Aside from that contrivance, he reunites with the other good guys, and the cliffhanger this time has the Falcon crew leave Cloud City, with Trioculus's factory destroyed, Zorba believing Leia had died in the explosion, when she was actually retrieved in time. And there's also a little bit where Han contemplates how he's going to propose to Leia, and that's book three. So to be honest, this was a more believable story, but it's still not without iffy writing. Such as Trioculus's delusional love for Princess Leia that doesn't really seem to line up with the rest of his character, or Ken using the Jedi mind trick. In fact, as I can see, Trioculus has been written out of the story for now, as he's now frozen in Carbonite. Whether that will still be the case by the end, it's another matter. Still, in terms of how Star Warsian it is, I think it's the most accurate to the universe compared to the first two books. But now I believe we should move on to book four. When I first heard the title, I wondered what the hell was so important about this Mount Yoda, and where this Mount Yoda was. My only guess was Kashyyyk, as I can see the Wookiees naming a mountain after him. There's just one problem though, Yoda having good relations with the Wookiees wasn't established until Revenge of the Sith, so if it was on Kashyyyk, that would be an incredibly lucky coincidence. A part of me actually wishes that happened, but the way the Expanded Universe writers improvised post-prequels was still impressive. Anyways, you'll be disappointed to hear that Mount Yoda is probably where you'd expect it to be. Dagobah. Except I don't remember Dagobah having mountains. It was a swamp planet, right? I guess it doesn't really matter. I also wanted to say that I've sort of adapted to this book series and its weirdness. I guess if you go into the meth zone for a while, it starts to lose its effect. I'm sort of used to the three-eyed X-Men such as Trioculus and Triclops. Yes, I know we haven't met Triclops yet, but he shows up finally in this book, and it's as weird as ever. Anyways, after the attack on Yavin 4, the rebel base is now on Dagobah, at the renamed Mount Yoda, respecting the deceased Jedi Master. The Supreme Prophets of the Dark Side stir up another annoying prophecy, which they use as an excuse to take over the Empire. You see, you might recall that Trioculus was frozen in Carbonite at the end of the last book. Well apparently the Empire retrieving him isn't that difficult, because when Zorba the Hutt leaves for Tatooine, and he trusts the Cloud City police force to keep the peace, the Imperials smuggle Trioculus in and out before the day is up. However, he isn't out of Carbonite just yet. Cadden proclaims himself the new Emperor, and orders the frozen Trioculus to be executed, and so he is. Although as you probably guessed, it was a fake out. I still am asking myself why these prophets are taken so seriously, because they're literally able to blackmail Grand Moff Hissa into following them, with the fact that they've got an embarrassing photo of him at the Christmas party. I have to criticize how these prophets are able to influence everyone just by giving out their prophecies. Prophecies, I might add, that always seem to benefit them in some way. I heard that it was retcon that the prophets were frauds or something, but still, why do people go against their best interests for these guys? It's incredibly weird being introduced to them and getting no insight to where the hell they were in the original trilogy. Like these guys would have been a pain in the ass for Emperor Palpatine, right? It's not really a surprise the Expanded Universe disregarded these stories. They don't make 
much sense, nor do they feel like Star Wars. Anyways, on the rebel side of things, Ken is told that he has to go to school, and he can't just go on wild adventures with the rest of the good guys. During all this, a Duros named Dustini shows up at the base and informs the good guys that the Imperials are raiding the world of Duro and stealing artifacts. So the main group of heroes are sent to the world. Despite the fact that Ken is supposed to stay behind, he accidentally gets on the Millennium Falcon taking off and is stuck on the journey. The circumstances are extremely silly and contrived. Anyways, the Falcon gets damaged on the way to Duro, and Han has to take a backup ship at a repair dock to finish the mission. To make a long story extremely short, turns out this is the world where Emperor Palpatine's true son Triclops has been hidden. He escaped from the insane asylum the Imperials put him in, and he encounters the good guys. First impressions are warm. He detests the Empire, and remarks that if he succeeded his father, he would use his power to destroy the Empire from within. There's a thing with Ken being captured briefly by the bad guys, including Grand Moff Hissa and an interrogator named Daphine, although the good guys along with Triclops save him. Despite the fact that Triclops does everything to help the good guys, upon returning to Dagobah, it's speculated whether or not Triclops truly intends to help the Rebel Alliance, or if he is not really the pacifist he says he is, and that is basically the cliffhanger it leaves us with. To be fair, the cliffhanger isn't that bad, since we did just meet Triclops, and everything said about him previously was that he was a lunatic, although that's what the Imperials officially stated. So Triclops' true nature is unknown, even if he seems to be a natural ally to the Rebellion at first. That's book 4, and to be honest, it still feels like the writers were on drugs, but that's only because they're continuing off a previous drug trip. There's a decent amount of progress made in the overall story, and it's still an enjoyable read. So let's move on to the next book. Something to note about this book is that the title only comes full circle at the end. This book mostly concerns Hart and Leia organizing a wedding, which given this is book 5 of 6, is saying something. This book starts with something really iffy, with the Rebels creating a top secret replication droid, which is basically a droid disguised as a human. Which human? Princess Leia of course, that's where I have to question this. A droid with the ability to replicate humans seemed like a stretch to the rules of Star Wars, and I wondered why the hell it couldn't be a clone. Crimson Empire did that to have a certain character replaced without anyone noticing, and that would have made more sense, and be grounded in the reality of the Star Wars universe, more so than a Terminator infiltrator unit. Which is what this reminded me of. I'm guessing that the writers might have thought that a clone would have been too immoral, since clones are living things, and the rebels growing a clone to use it for missions kinda sounds like slavery. Keep in mind this applies to all clones in general, unless it's the lifeless ones Palpatine had in Dark Empire. Anyways, the designer of the Terminator, yes I'm calling it that, shut up, gets into an accident and is mortally injured. Han, Leia, 3PO, and R2 go to the designer's homeworld since the proper supplies for his species will be there, which the planet is unironically called Chad. The designer was a Chadra fan, which are those rodent aliens that could be seen briefly in A New Hope, and there were a few of them in Knights of the Old Republic too. Point is, after all this setup, in which the designer makes a recovery, Han decides to take Leia to the Star Wars equivalent of Disney World. Han finally proposes to Leia, and they plan to go get married at an intergalactic tourist attraction called Hologram Fun World. And get this, Lando after losing the governorship of Cloud City, quickly recovered by becoming the owner of the theme park. For the first half of the book, there isn't really any conflict. Han and Leia just prepare to get married, with Han already giving Leia a ring he was given by a Duros in the last book, and Leia buying her own ring for Han. Lando tries to help the two get hitched, and for the first half, I feel like I'm reading a romance novel, with not much else going on. It's a while before any of the villains show up in the presentation of the book, so there isn't much to hold you over. 
Eventually, we get reintroduced to Zorba the Heart, who as the new governor of Cloud City, is not making enough money. Because apparently Hologram Fun World is some stiff competition. So Zorba decides they've got to ruin and vandalize the place, scare off tourists, and so on. I guess that's in character for a hut at the end of the day. Anyways, after some dicking around, Lando informs Han and Leia that they'll need their birth certificates to get married. Han says that his birth certificate's at his place on Cloud City, and Leia says that hers was lost when the Death Star destroyed Alderaan. Han possessing a birth certificate doesn't make much sense since he was an orphan on Corellia, but the lack of attention to detail aside, they can't get married right away. They have to wait to get new birth certificates printed based on their IDs, then they can get married. So in the meantime, Lando gets them to attend a show. When Zorba and his band of bounty hunters show up to cause chaos, one of the goons sees Leia and informs Zorba that Leia is still alive, in which Zorba decides to kidnap Leia and personally witness her be eaten by the Sarlacc back on Tatooine as revenge. So yeah, conveniently, the show performer is a Bith, and one of Zorba's goons just happens to be a Bith too. So the goon posing as the performer in the second act tricks Leia into coming on stage for a magic trick in which she's locked in a cage and the bounty hunters fire their blasters and cause chaos. The way the book presents things, it's a little too ridiculous for me to take seriously. And this magic trick shit and everything else the book showed so far seemed too close to real life. When Leia went into a jewelry shop to buy a wedding ring for Han, I was honestly imagining a real life jewelry store from Earth. I don't know. I was sort of taken out of the universe. Since what was described made me think too much of the real world. Same goes for the show stage. I was imagining one of those stages you'd see in Las Vegas, since they do a lot of shows there. An overarching criticism of the series is that it doesn't feel like Star Wars, so keep that in mind. With Leia kidnapped, Zorba of course expresses his evil plan, as well as showing her the frozen block of carbonite that contains Trioculus. Yeah, that block that was smuggled out of Cloud City was a fake, as I previously mentioned, and Zorba tricked everyone. However, this is where the Grand Moths, including Hissa, make their entrance. They intercept Zorba the Hutt's ship, since they happen to be near Tatooine, and they discover Trioculus after boarding Zorba's ship and overwhelming him and his goons with stormtroopers. So they thaw him out, and as you can probably guess, after questioning Zorba, he learns where Leia is, and practically does his own proposal to Leia, in which he's harshly rejected. But Trioculus is going to force Leia to marry him anyways. So yeah, despite giving Zorba his word that he would spare him, Trioculus immediately has the hut thrown down into the Sarlacc pit, topping it off with the snarky remark, Who's laughing now? <laughs> now Han, Lando, and the droids learn last minute that Luke Ken, and the Terminator modeled after Leia snuck onto the Falcon, and were present the whole time, which is super convenient, in which they plan to crash the wedding and replace Leia with the decoy. To make a long story short, the plan works, as the decoy poses as Leia, and then at the last minute, ejects its laser weaponry out of its eyes and mortally wounds Trioculus before the decoy is taken down. All the meanwhile, the Sarlacc eventually spits out Zorba the Hutt in the most blatant case of plot armor before Reva the Third Sister. Yes, go take a look at the book yourself. That actually happened. And that's how the book closes. So this book alone was a wild ride of a drug trip. And I'm unsure whether I'm hallucinating or not. It certainly feels like it is though. Despite the first half, the second half had enough methamphetamine to keep me going. Although I would argue this was pretty much a weak entry in the series due to the slow first half without much conflict. Anyways, with that being said, let's try to get to the end of the series without succumbing to a drug addiction. Which is already likely given we've overdosed five times in a row already. You are not ready for any of this. This book has the most meth fueled into it, and let me tell you that it's hard to recover. In Prophets of the Dark Side, all is revealed, and it's like the writings of a man-man, and I know I already said that, but try to multiply it by 10. We pick up where the last book left off, 
in which Trioculus succumbs to his wounds, but before he dies, makes Grand Moff Hissa swear to him that he will eliminate Luke Skywalker and his friends, thereby avenging his death. Trioculus gets the typical space funeral, in which he's cremated, and his ashes are launched into space. Now you probably noticed that I didn't really mention Triclops in the last book, and that's because he was barely present. They were saving all the wacky stuff for this book. Apparently, Triclops, unknown to himself, is a sleeper agent for Cadden, the dark side prophet guy. He was caught sleepwalking numerous times, gathering intel on the lost city of the Jedi. Again, this is incredibly absurd, and makes me wonder how hard the writers of this book snorted coke. Anyways, point is, the Rebels find out that Triclops, despite being a good guy, has some programming that allows him to be an Imperial spy. Then we've got Zorba, who after making his way back to civilization, meets up with the prophets of the dark side, and informs them on the attempted betrayal of the Grand Moths, in which they're all put on a sham trial, and sentenced to harsh punishments. Grand Moff Hissa of course gets the harshest punishment, in which they intend to quote, starve him, and feed him a parasitic meal that will kill him after he's gone insane with hunger. Then of course, on the good guy's side, after learning that Triclops is a sleeper agent, they get a lead that indicates that they can shut off Triclops's brainwashing implants on a world called Azred, which is a hostile planet full of dangerous wildlife. Plus, the world is completely occupied by the Empire. Both Luke and Ken on the mission are captured and taken to Cadden, in which Ken is given some truth Serum, and against his better judgement, spills the beans on where the lost city of the Jedi is. There's actually a part a bit before then, where Hissa is forced to scout out a false lead, which results in his death, and then Ken is forced to reveal the location of the lost city of the Jedi. Yeah, so there's a shitload of revelations concerning Ken the Jedi Prince. You see, Cadden already knows everything about Ken, and upon gaining access to the terminal in the lost city of the Jedi, he shows Ken who his parents were. So basically his mother was a quote Jedi princess named Ken Delina, whom Ken is named after, who was captured by the Empire, and forced to work as a nurse on the spice mines of Kessel. There she met the one and only Triclops, and conceived a child with him. That of course being Ken. Yeah, so after all that build up, we learn that Ken is the son of Triclops, who is the son of Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> Okay, I know The Rise of Skywalker was perhaps one of the worst Star Wars stories ever made, but Jesus Christ, is even the madman's meth-fueled addict creation known as Jedi Prince so much better? Unlike The Rise of Skywalker, Jedi Prince had a clear direction and actual build-up. Basically the bare minimum for an effective story, but it had it nonetheless. Seriously, you know J.J. Abrams done goofed when he couldn't even do better than the much ridiculed Jedi Prince. The same story with three-eyed mutants and bizarre prophets and other shit that make no sense whatsoever. It's also worth noting that Ken has an appropriate shocked reaction, and unlike the Rise of Skywalker, Luke directly reminds Ken after the fact that being the offspring of evil means nothing towards who he is. He may be the grandson of Emperor Palpatine, but he still has the capability of making the right choices and shaping his own destiny. Because no one decides who they're related to. Luke can all but relate, since his own father was Darth Vader. And that revelation back in the Empire Strikes Back sucked for him big time. He might have been more mature to handle such information than Ken was, but that's still a tough pill to swallow. Jesus, reading Jedi Prince was almost like experiencing a better Rise of Skywalker. Because Rise of Skywalker also comes off like the work of a madman, a story that makes absolutely no sense, and has poor consideration for the Star Wars universe. But unlike Rise of Skywalker, Jedi Prince actually had a plan, an abided roadmap, and a clear direction. Even if Jedi Prince was largely discarded by the expanded universe for its weirdness, it was still an actual effort. Both might have been made under the influence of drugs, but the Rise of Skywalker was clearly made under the influence of alcohol too. Because J.J. Abrams and Chris Terrio were so drunk on top of high, 
that they completely lost their sanity with the rise of Skywalker. No wonder J.J. Abrams is so unoriginal. It would be impossible to come up with new ideas under the combined influence of both substances. To wrap this whole thing up, Luke and friends show up to save Ken and their escape, trapping Cadden and the other prophets down in the lost city of the Jedi after the main terminal gets destroyed. After Ken reads a letter written to him by Triclops, in which Triclops pretty much confesses everything, all before fleeing into the jungle of Yavin 4, all the characters prepare for Han and Leia's wedding, and there's a brief moment of Leia having a vision of her future children Jason and Jaina Solo, and yeah, that's the end of this meth-infused nightmare, which was subsequently and heavily retconned by future Expanded Universe stories. Source books and future novels either reform the information or outright ignore it. Jedi Prince was at one point retconned to be a fairy tale Leia told her children, and none of it actually happened. And there was a bunch of other random shit that happened to retcon the story according to Wikipedia. Since this came out after Hand of the Empire, it's worth noting that an inconsistency between the two stories is that Dagobah was kept a closely guarded secret by Luke, so there being a rebel base there is implausible. Hell, I recall in Jedi Academy, which takes place 10 years after Endor, the disciples of Ragnos had to do a lot of digging to discover that Luke went to Dagobah right after the Battle of Hoth. So yeah, even before it was retconned, they clearly did not read an earlier book very closely. With that being said, that's Jedi Prince. And now the verdict. You can tell that this is obviously one of the most wacky Star Wars stories ever. A question I have is how the f this got published. Like, come on, Hair to the Empire might have had some weird stuff too, but that wasn't made under the influence of drugs. I've even read some of the original Marvel comics, and that was grounded in the Star Wars universe a billion times more than Jedi Prince. I will say this, however, this was an actual attempt to enhance legacy characters, rather than to shit on them. It failed, of course, but there's no malicious intent to be seen here. In terms of a Star Wars adaptation, this would easily be like a 2 out of 10. But as an entertaining story, I actually have to give it a 7.5 out of 10. It's wacky, dumb fun, and I guess I can't be too concerned about the canonicity of this story since it's been widely disregarded. This was one hell of a roller coaster ride. So now that I've got Jedi Prince out of the way, we should be continuing with the actual expanded universe. The stuff that wasn't thrown immediately out the window immediately. And next we'll look at Trusa Bakura, and then the Jedi Academy trilogy. And I'll just have to keep a watchful eye over what comes next. I'm Ginger Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Under the mountain.